Chase presents his talk today, AIDS, Cultural Activism and Speculative Health Promotion. The project draws on a variety of archival materials, moving image productions, public health campaigns, and historical ephemera to understand the relationship between biomedical, social, and cultural interpretations of HIV intervention strategies since 1996. The talk will be followed by a space for questions and comments. So now I will invite you to listen to Chase. Perfect. Thanks, Edgar. Thanks, Daniel. And thanks, Jonathan and Robbie in the background. Um, it's nice to have you all here today. Let me go ahead and share my presentation and we'll get um, started. Let's do this. All right. Okay, so let's have a look. Today I'm going to be talking about AIDS cultural activism and speculative health promotion, which is a significant part of the larger project that I'm doing on the idea of the of post AIDS or the end of AIDS as a public health campaign that is happening both at local, national and global levels. So I'm gonna be focusing on this concept today, um, which I'll introduce shortly. Um, but some of the guiding questions that I'm going to focus on um, are, um, what is speculative health promotion? Who and what does it impact? And why does it matter? In asking these questions, I invite viewers to engage with the potential strengths and limitations of thinking through speculative Im imagery, not simply as an intellectual task, but as, a par as part of a larger community project that conceives of public health criticism as an opportunity to resist historical and institutional oppression and make serious social, cultural, and economic changes in the present. So today's presentation will look specifically at two recent examples of visual media, which might not at first appear to be public health promotion, yet, as I will try to show, these media inform a broader public approach to rethinking the need and use of health promotion as an activist strategy. Public health promotion is typically thought of as a professional practice sustained by clinical work, formal public health outreach and advocacy initiatives. But I want to expand this definition to include historical and contemporary visual art that challenges the perceived boundaries of health promotion in order to pose a specific question for queer communities. How do we sustain queer health practices in a world that continues to limit our existence? I define health promotion as a practice that engages health as a form of struggle. That is, a struggle which demands multiple and sometimes conflicting mess messages about living with health and illness in society. I contrast this with the assumption that health promotion must be legitimized as an institutional discourse that constructs health and illness in order to discipline individual behaviors in the name of a common good. In using this definition, I invite the viewer to consider the preconceived boundaries of health promotion as an institution and question whether health promotion is also an everyday practice shaped by our engagement with institutional messages and sometimes our resistance to and remaking of those institutional messages. Setting out with this definition, I seek to make room for a new conception of health promotion, which has lingered within the AIDS cultural media since the very beginning of the AIDS crisis in the 1980s and has recently become prevalent across both institutional and lay perspectives of health promotion. I will use the concept speculative health promotion to describe a visual culture of queer struggle that seeks to visualize, negotiate, and contest how healthy futures are produced through the entanglement of institutional and lay health narratives. The idea of speculation or what in, in academic scholarship is commonly called speculative inquiry is a potentially unwieldy concept. So in order to situate its significance in relation to health promotion, I'm going to turn to a first example to discuss the visual and discursive features of speculative health promotion. So the Fathers Project was created across 2018 and 2019 by the Mexican-American artist Leo Herrera. It is a five-part web series which was recently turned into a 45-minute condensed speculative documentary for film circuits. The series weaves together documentary footage and fictional narrative to imagine what the United States might look like, quote, if AIDS had never happened. He begins uh, with the conjuring of the AIDS dead, employing historical groups that confronted the early AIDS crisis, such as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and the Gay Men's Health Crisis, 
to create a reparative reading of queer history. In doing so, Herrera brings back to life the many artists and creative producers who died from AIDS-related illnesses in the 1980s and 90s. He then reflects on how queer creators, health promoters, and scientists might work together to build a more queer inclusive society, specifically by supporting gay-friendly politicians, enacting queer-driven science, and constructing community programs for gay youth and aging populations. In the clip we are about to see, Herrera entangles ongoing perceptions of biomedical technologies with previous forms of AIDS cultural activism in order to envision a world where STIs can be effectively eradicated. He uses speculative inquiry to conceive of a desired future which viewers can both reflect upon and enact by engaging with and constructing similar queer strategies in the present. So we're gonna watch a short clip here. All right, I think that's a, a pretty good snapshot of some of the speculative inquiry that's happening in Leo Herrera's project. So let's go ahead and return. So in this sequence, Herrera conjures a future desire to eradicate known STIs through the redevelopment of an ex existing biotechnology that is amyl nitrates or poppers as they're commonly known, which is modified using queer driven science to question what sexual liberation might look like for a queer future. Herrera's vision also delights in remaking the cultural conditions of health and illness, drawing out mythologies such as the distribution of poppers in the New York nightclub Studio 54, and the remobilization of the gay men's health crisis as the gay men's health force, which provides communal, communal healthcare services to advance the idea that a world without AIDS is imminent in history, as well as bound up in the AIDS-defined present. By using speculative inquiry, Herrera creates a critical link between a mythological past and a desired future that reuses and recreates health activism for new health-related goals. His speculative imagery foregrounds the desire for a technologically sophisticated queer community where biomedical development is in the hands of queer folks rather than the historically oppressive pharmaceutical industries and conservative governments. What's more, situating technological progress as a means of envisioning queer health helps to connect Herrera's work with contemporary health campaigns, such as the Global End of AIDS Initiative and the local UK campaign, Test Now, Stop HIV, all of which seek to press home the message that the, the dissemination of biomedical treatments will bring about a world without AIDS. The point I wish to make here is that when we probe the possibilities of multiple futures across a wide range of visual health materials, including those media not sanctioned by institutional bodies, we open ourselves to reconsider what tools are needed to produce healthy futures. In doing so, we accrue meaning around the idea that health is and always has been driven by individual and community initiatives, and that the futures they desire must remain present across all forms of health promotion, rather than advancing highly individualistic views that serve institutional and disciplinary visions of a healthy society. We'll come back to this point later, but here I wish to suggest that the creative potential of health activism within art has much to offer the swiftly changing conditions of health and illness in society and provides us with opportunities to redevelop our health, health promotion strategies through both realized and unrealized needs, as well as vocalized and marginalized viewpoints using creative contexts. So I'm going to move on to a second example, which again may initially surprise viewers, when I call some elements of this work speculative health promotion since its historical context is largely set in the 1980s. However, I turn to consider how Russell T. Davies' recent It's a Sin presents viewers with opportunities to learn about AIDS histories whilst simultaneously giving them opportunities to rethink how health is constructed in those histories. In several instances, I suggest that the series encourages the viewer to contest the boundaries of health and illness using a speculative framework. So for a little background, appearing on the Channel 4 streaming platform in January 2021, It's a Sin is a five-part miniseries set in London from 1981 to 1991. It depicts the lives of a group of gay men and their friends who lived during the early AIDS crisis and features an ensemble 
which confronts the large scale homophobia that characterized this historical moment. The series dramatizes the action taken by a certain middle class culture against the social and cultural messages that surrounded AIDS, including, um, for instance, reactions to the 1987 Tombstone campaign and a small scale struggle with rubber gloved police. What is perhaps most interesting is that the series breaks the fourth wall in order to interpolate the viewer into critical conversations about the emergence and transmission of HIV. And then it later employs revisionist re narrative practices to make queer resistance legible within AIDS history. To articulate the use of speculative inquiry in particular, I want to look at two moments where the series both highlights perceptions of health and illness in AIDS histories, and also opens those perceptions to reflexive conversations about the transformations of health promotion in both historical and contemporary contexts. So let's go ahead and have a look at another um, clip. All right, so this is a sequence um, fairly early on in the series. Um, I'll explain just a little more. Uh, let's have a look. All right, so this sequence is perhaps the most obvious of the series' engagement with health promotion as both a historical and contemporary problem. Richie, played by Ali Alexander, faces the camera in a speech which at once lambasts the conspiracy theories of early HIV transmission, but also creates a narrative structure which holds both the characters and the contemporary viewable viewer. Um, at arm's length from the dramatic scene in which HIV has become a problem. At the same time, through this campy contestation of these conspiracies, the direct address hints at the revised history that enables this point blank, point blank encounter, which means that it highlights a perceived farce of the transmission routes and the security of the contemporary moments through this farce or this debunking of these claims. Uh, it creates a metastructure, in other words, that allows contemporary viewers grappling with the uncertainties of health promotion strategies to see themselves reflected, reflected in the narrative frame. We see this especially when Richie points a finger at a group of middle-aged men, a gesture which channels the early perception that the gay 70s precipitated the so-called gay plague, but which also signifies the trope of generations of HIV. The enclosed past, that is the older generation of gay men who preceded the AIDS crisis and the unclosed future, including the young folks who have been impacted by AIDS are here entangled in this scene and help to link the series to ongoing conversations about who or what shapes healthy futures. Though it does not posit a clear message about how to resolve these tensions, its speculative position of multiple possible messages of health and illness signals the need for a critical conversation about what coalitions and community politics are needed to bring about its perceived futures. So I'm gonna to turn to a second clip to articulate how this framing naturalizes a cultural positioning of the futures of AIDS, which is endemic to these kind of speculative images of AIDS across many different types of platforms. And it's a point that is largely absent from institutional health promotion messages, but which I want to foreground as a key conversation for queer populations through cultural production. The omni omnipresence of revisionist AIDS histories within this series raises a critical question about how specul speculative images might help communities to consider the changing dimensions of healthy futures through their own creative means. So one more, um, image of one more example here, different window. Okay, we'll just skip over it because it is not working. Anyway, so the example here was a moment in the fourth episode where, let me pull up my notes real quick. Okay, it was a moment in the fourth episode where Ash, played by Nathaniel Curtis, tells a group of his friends about a new temporary job he gets working in a local school. The homophobic head teacher assigns Ash to call the school library for any mention of homosexuality following the introduction of Section 28, a 1988 law which prohibited the promotion of homosexuality by any local authority or school. The scene escalates somewhat humorously as Ash's rage shapes his desire um, in response to the head teacher, at first arguing for the absence of homosexuality in history, 
and thus the impossibility of infection as, the, as they use um, in the dialogue through classical literature. And then once prompted by Ritchie, acquiescing to the task and the outing of gay friendly work of Mary Renault. This scene I suggest uses revisionist history to illuminate the desire for an activist future. Ash fabricates a story about his desired interaction, signaling the need to protect a rich history of homosexuality whilst simultaneously silencing the history through an impassioned critique of Thatcher's law. Whilst this revisionist strategy potentially erases what many scholars have found to be a rich history of encoded homosexuality, the scene draws out the need to foreground this kind of protected behavior in history, to naturalize queer history, and to contest and negotiate the infectious links between homosexuality and HIV. To put that simply, the scene encodes an activist strategy. It invites viewers to contest the perceived boundaries of health and illness within this history, not simply along the lines of homosexuality, but also in relation to what care queer communities perceive as important to building healthy futures. So let's move on to the two questions that I have. So after looking at these examples and thinking about what they offer, an initial understanding of health promotion as a cultural st strategy for producing healthy futures, I'm going to circle back very quickly to answer the other two questions that I have here. So first, who and what does speculative health promotion impact? So there are two central areas I'm arguing for. And the first one is this idea that individuals and communities that are pre already marginalized by health promotion might be um, impacted by bringing together creative methods for um, integrating new voices or voices that have largely been absented from mainstream um, conversations about HIV in particular, but certainly health, sexual health um, through um, arts-based practices. So the purpose of speculative health promotion, which you will recall I've described as an integrated visual culture of queer struggle that seeks to visualize, negotiate, and contest how healthy futures are produced, creates accountability through image production by suggesting that healthy futures are multiple rather than singular and technologically fixed. A speculative approach demands the confluence of radically different visions of the future to come together in dialogue. What I'm suggesting it is that those multiple futures need to be explored through creative experimentation, because we know that collaborative work with activists, artists, community members, researchers, scientists, and clinicians leads to community-driven conversations. The obvious second impact um, is an interdisciplinary working model for researchers and practitioners. Um, I'm arguing that such a, a concept foregrounds representational politics and modes of health promotion that are not exclusive domains of particular professions, areas of research, or indeed of singular scholars. This concept, which facilitates often under explored rep relationships between institutional community and individual stakeholders, allows public health scholars, practitioners, and theorists to consider how and why perceptions of health may change according, in the case of queer communities, to the need for longer term plans focused on sexual rights and the integration of queer driven science. So in my final question here, I'm asking, why does all this matter? So the idea of speculative health promotion demands attention not only to how futures are produced within queer visual media, often neglected by institutional bodies, but also how these institutional players can work together with a huge range of researchers and communities to rethink health promotion strategies. Key partnerships are blocked by the assumption that um, public health is confined to disciplinary measures, and so I suggest that a new conception of health promotion that makes space for public health officials, clinicians, sociologists, cultural and queer theorists, health activists, and community members creates a more rigorous dialogue for futures that outlast the technological end debates. Thinking critically about the use of speculation will inevitably help all of these researchers and practitioners to better serve communities and for communities to have platforms to speak more readily about their perceptions of healthy futures. So in closing, I want to argue for, or I have been arguing for in my work, um, a conception of health promotion, which aligns with a need for a holistic care structure that is more attentive to the precarious futures emerging from the present. This is no less urgent in a time when the NHS is increasingly taxed and at risk of major defunding, and as in the UK, in particular, continues to divest from queer-friendly initiatives, such as the recent UNAIDS um, divestment from uh, the UK divestment from UNAIDS, um, and um, other trans health related issues. My work seeks to create explicit engagement with an integration of multiple viewpoints curated through community outreach, visual artwork, and creative perspectives of biomedical use. 
to make room for multiple futures that individuals and communities desire. This, I argue, has the potential to build social and cultural strategies for engaging the desire for many kinds of healthy futures among queer communities. All right, thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to any questions or things you would like to explore. Thank you very much, Chase, for this. And um, thank you, thank you so much for, for this talk and for introducing us to these these two uh, these two series or these two uh, I haven't watched any of them, so it's it's a really really good introduction, and I feel very very curious about about them now. I, I don't know if there is um, any questions in the um, in the audience. You can just raise your hand and ask them directly, or you can put them in the Q&A section. So we have one here already. Can we apply similar approaches, speculation to COVID-19 to overcome the inequalities that define it? I think this is a great question. So thanks for this question. Um, I think that there are a lot of researchers who are thinking right now about the relationship between chronic illness um, and health narratives and the use of um, arts-based methods to um, either facilitate conversations um, between disparate populations, so perhaps maybe institutional bodies and maybe people who are impacted by, by COVID-19. So surely there are opportunities to engage with these, these, with these populations, meaning the entirety of society, but especially people who are um, inversely impacted by COVID-19 in a way that can certainly help us not only rethink about what we can do to help them, but how maybe we can restructure um, what we need for a healthcare system or what we need for particular communities by reaching out to ask them, hey, like maybe they don't have the words to verbalize what they want to say, but they can say like, here's what the future looks like for me, or here's what I perceive my individual future to be like. We can take from that as researchers and say, here's the, the various different futures that are manifesting in these communities. And we can try and pull a kind of, um, piecework together to try and understand what we can do to, to provide for communities since after all we are working with communities rather than as individual researchers for the purpose of, of um, institutions. Thanks for that. We have another question here. By imagining futures without AIDS or HIV, are we erasing the existence struggle of people living with HIV? And where is the balance? Is there, is, is there something we learn or miss to learn from looking at futures without? This is also a great question. So thanks for this um, series of questions. And I think there's an important point to make here, especially in relation to the Herrera one, which has had a lot of um, criticism lobbed at it, which I think in some cases is rightly so, um, of imagining a future without AIDS and as if there nothing had happened and we had um, gone forward. His is specifically about the art community and what art would, would look like in a world without AIDS. Um, but of course, we need to, as you perhaps saw a little bit in this series and uh, in, in the examples that I presented here, but if you were to look at the, in, the series as its entirety, um, AIDS is everywhere in this series. And indeed, in a lot of AIDS, an end of AIDS um, campaigns and a lot of um, specifically cultural end of AIDS or cultural post AIDS projects of the 2010s in particular, a lot of these things are still ruminating upon, they're still reflecting upon the capacity of AIDS to teach us many things. So even while we're looking towards the future, there's a lot of um, like health activism that's informing what that future looks like. It's pulling on um, metaphors of, of illness and disease to think about like, is, are we capable of creating strategies for supporting each other, knowing full well that there will be future disease um, outbreaks, that there will be future epidemics, that there will be future, um, in the case of the NHS, we might need to, to find other means of supporting each other. Um, so I think that um, there are certain, there are absolutely dangers of, of perhaps losing sight of, of the past. But at the same time, I think that post-AIDS in particular, which I don't really touch on here, but which my research is really invested in, um, is, is such a contentious term because we continue to think of post-AIDS as this concept that looks very much at this, this idea of the kind of the, the, the end of crisis, which is typically positioned as a kind of late 90s, 2000s discourse, but the 2010s with the revival of a huge amount of um, AIDS cultural research and, and projects um, starts to rethink the boundaries of that and says, oh, wait, we actually can do something with the AIDS past to make it really legible and helpful in the present. 
There is another question here. Hi, Chase. What were your thoughts on how the language of HIV prevention messaging in public campaigns changed last year when sex between different households was officially prohibited? There's a lot of different um, ways to approach this question, but um, I think I'll, I'll give you a couple of, uh, of different re responses here. Um, I think the, the first one is frustration that sex immediately disappeared um, from view um, or was absented, especially in, in the case of, of uh, the UK government, of not really talking about it until about the beginning of June when they said, no, nope, you can't have sex, don't have sex, don't touch each other. Um, so there was a certain frustration that I noticed working with uh, people in, in the community here in Edinburgh, um, as well as people elsewhere in the UK. Um, but I also think that um, after reflecting on it a great deal um, over the, of the year plus of, of COVID, that there's, there's been a lot of really good initiatives that have emerged um, from um, institutions working together. Um, to think about, well, how do we have a how do we have sex in a pandemic? So we have people um, working at 5016 Street, at Prepster, um, at HIV Scotland, at all sorts of different places, especially in the case of HIV Scotland, where we got a new testing campaign that came out um, that provided testing um, um, kits, um, HIV testing kits for a huge population um, through the mail um, during uh, the, the early months of this year, which was fantastic. Um, so certainly there's there's the the, the, there's good and bad that came from that, but still I would err on the side that good things have, have come from that, yeah. We have another question here. I wonder if um, the persons who wrote it, would you like to, to, um, to ask directly or? Yeah, hi Edgar, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to speak up, dare I say I'm not a shy one. Uh, yeah, hi Chase, really my question is just about, uh, dare I say, geopolitics and all of this and how that comes back to, uh, you know, cultural production and global health history. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, I, I don't know Herrera's work and I'm really looking forward to checking it out, but really just wondering, uh, do you look at kind of the, the politics of how global health histories, and that also includes kind of, you know, uh, queer AIDS histories, uh, do you look at kind of the geopolitics of that? Because when we look at um, uh, LGBT histories and HIV and AIDS, we do tend to see a very kind of global global north perspective. I'm just wondering if you actually kind of unpack that in your research or if it's something that you're kind of exploring on yeah. any level. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Thanks so much for, for asking it. And I think that it definitely is something that I'm interested in. Um, though I, most of my, my cultural research focuses on the global north presently, um, the Herrera's project in particular has a really troubling encounter with with the idea of different regions of the world um, specifically through his imagining of the U.S. state as being a, an imperial state that continues to take over other places of the world in order to create queer liberation so certainly this narrative and I hope that you will you will engage with it and talk about it because there's lots here it's an incredible um, and sometimes disturbing um, piece of cultural um, media um, but what it offers us is the opportunities to engage with, as you're suggesting, these really important questions about, well, why do, why do these media continue to be produced by the Global North? And indeed, why aren't we giving funding to other places in the world to, to have these conversations? And indeed, if we are getting funding to other places in the world, why aren't those images platformed um, in the Global North and, and vice versa? Um, certainly uh, questions that, as you're suggesting, definitely need to be uh, answered. Thanks for that, Chase. Yeah, not easy to address. Um, yeah, really looking forward to seeing your work emerge. And I'll check out Herrera, dare I say, for uh, better or worse, because it does feel quite imperial in terms of how it's being pitched. Uh, not, not imperial by you, I hope that is clear. It's just no, a, the, okay. the narrative in it feels quite masculinist in some ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We have an anonymous question. Hi. In imagining post -A HIV AIDS futures, how do you think we can better address the lived experiences of an increasing number of people living with HIV who are of an advanced age? Uh, yeah, this is another really nice question. So um, 
I think there's there's a there's an interesting tension in this question of um, our future is not legible for people who are in an advanced age, whatever that happens to be. And I don't think that that is the case. We certainly should be including everyone within these conversations, especially people who happen to be in that demo, that that precede demographic. I guess it's not precede; it's an actual demographic within um, HIV research that is a, a particular um, age range who lived through the the initial um, impact of of the AIDS crisis. Um, so the, the 1980s and the 1990s, especially some people who didn't have access and continued to not have access to treatments um, at the end of the 90s and the 2000s and still today in, in many, many, many parts of the world. Um, I think, especially for people in aging populations, um, this is an opportunity for them to engage with researchers, but also to engage with other people of their, their age demographic, if you like. Um, and indeed, a really important part um, of the end of AIDS initiatives, especially in London focused in AIDS, um, AIDS initiatives, is about creating communities and intercultural communities. Um, so I think that this could be an opportunity to continue and sustain those conversations because um, as we see in the example of um, 56 Dean Street's The Grass is Always Grinder, there's this, this critical politic of the, the young people won't listen to us despite having shared experiences of HIV and sexual health and this kind of stuff. So if we are more attentive, maybe not in, in the case of The Grass is Always Grinder, being less attentive to the kind of pathologies that surround HIV and more attentive to the kind of affective networks, the use of emotion and the, the building relationships with one another, then we might be able to create those, those um, relationships in, in much more meaningful ways than um, subscribing, again, in the case of um, the grass is always grinder to this, this kind of narrow vision of a future um, that it amounts to, to treatment of HIV, but doesn't amount to the, the kind of careful um, and, and caring relationships that we want to, to produce through these, these campaigns. We have another anonymous question. I'd love to hear more about ways in which it's a sin is both historical and also speculative. My sense of it's a sin is that even down to the level of its production design, costuming, etc., it had a strangely atemporal aesthetic, perhaps in an effort to appeal to current youth audiences. The young characters in the series denying the reality of AIDS in 1981 seem almost to stand in for the imagined naive young viewers today figured as uninformed about the history of AIDS itself, which the series is educate them, edu educating them on. Yeah, um, this is um, quite, quite an expansive ask here. Um, but I think that you, you've listed a lot of important points about um, a, a larger phenomenon that's happening in, in AIDS cultural media in the, in the global north, which is this idea that we can use AIDS history as a, as a pedagogical tool to teach people, specifically younger generations, and to interact with other generations who have been living with HIV and AIDS. Um, so when I say that, a, that um, It's a Sin has speculative elements, I don't mean to say that the entirety of the series um, is speculative, but as you're suggesting here, actually there might be some forms of speculation here that are happening that kind of create a connection between whatever constructed past that's happening through what, what I think Russell is kind of saying is a, like a kind of docu-drama kind of thing, although I would kind of, I would really contest the idea that he, he's using his own experiences per se, because it's very much a, a dramatized version, and indeed, as you're suggesting, a kind of a temporal version of this history, but at the same time, that's not the point. The, the point, of course, is, as you're suggesting, this kind of pedagogical tool, and we see a, a lot of viewers, especially in, in journalism, have suggested, well, it's, it's, it's a really interesting tool, but that's just what it is. It, it functions to have people to, to facilitate conversations about history, but does it actually tell that history in a meaningful way? Well, I guess that's not something that I'm going to, to, to say here, but I'm going to say that it's, it's starting that conversation about, well, what are the kinds of histories that need to be produced in this, this larger movement that's happening to think about HIV and its impact both on the past and on the present, um, and what we can do to continue to either integrate that history into the present, um, or do we need to have different perspectives of history in order to move forward? And I think that's really how we should be thinking about this series. Thank you very much, Chase. Uh, I see there is a space here for me to ask a question myself because I don't see any pending questions there. How, how can we create more of this content, more of these spaces to discuss these? Because I, I am really interested in research communication, not only about HIV and AIDS, but 
about LGBTQIA plus topics in general. And, and I often feel that there is more that we could do. So how could, how could we do that? How could we facilitate that to happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Edgar. Um, I'm going to give you a specific exa example of something that I've done in the community um, in the past couple of years. So the Scottish Storytelling Centre here in Edinburgh has, is a great opportunity to do public engagement with people. They don't um, necessarily focus on a particular social issue or a cultural issue. They're welcoming of whoever's working in the community. They really want to engage people with researchers, um, with, with professionals, with people who are working on creative projects. Um, and they want you to, to tell your story, essentially. Um, so one of the projects that I worked on with a researcher at Dundee um, was thinking about how do we get people to talk about their emotions, how they value emotions, what the emotions mean to the body. Um, and we used the, the, the networks at the, at the storytelling center, this was pre-COVID, um, and we, we used their spaces to in, interact with people um, to, to, in this instance, they got to create, um, what are these called? Um, they were like, um, um, like graphic novel um, pages. So they got to create their own, use art to, to create their own images and their own takes on what emotions mean to them. And there was no, like, there was no obligation for them to, to, to create anything, but it was like, here's an opportunity for you to, to work um, on a page where you can visualize um, what emotions mean to you and what that means to your body. And they had an opportunity to look through many different types of examples of this. They got to look, for example, through um, Alison Bechtel's work, thinking about the, the relationship between emotions and trauma and the body and this kind of stuff. Um, and then worked with me and then we, with the, the researcher at Dundee um, was a, a graphic artist. So they had an opportunity to work with them. Um, and so the moral of this story is I think that we can bring researchers together into these spaces to work very um, intentionally with community members. That doesn't have to be didactic either. It can be like, here's an, an idea that we want to engage with you with. We're not trying to teach you anything. We just want you to like explore what this means for you and what this means for your life. So I think we should be actively cultivating cultural and social spaces where people can op can create can create and can engage in these 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 types of encounters. And of course, I'm very well aware that COVID, of course, makes this a much trickier position for us. But I hope that this will allow us an opportunity to think about the, both the value of that and how we can maybe recreate or reinvent those spaces in the, in the coming years. Yes, that's a, a wonderful example of things that we could do that are very immediate as well because they are available in the local area and things that we could do and if people are based in other in other areas maybe to explore what is available in their own regions and see what what can be done there as well and if if i could have a, a follow-up to that um, what is the how do you see like the responses that um, that the general public can have to, to these type of projects, because my experience is that the LGBTQIA plus communities are very welcoming of these of these um, projects or endeavors, but sometimes it can be quite challenging to expand to other to other audiences that are not familiar to these um, to these issues that we experience as part of these of this rainbow umbrella of, of peoples so how how do we get to those audiences and how do we i don't know work towards a more united um, group or to yeah, how do we reach to those difficult audiences? Yeah, it's, an, it's another good question. I think this uh, is something that can that we can learn from AIDS history, especially about. Um, so the activist coalitions such as ACT UP London or ACT UP New York are prime examples of, pe of places where, of course, there were lots of queer people there, but they weren't exclusively queer. There were lots of people there who were straight, um, who, were, who didn't identify on, on those scales and can talk about, if we, if we talk about these issues in terms of kind of activist politics as things that are engaged in community politics, we can start to invite people to think about the various dimensions of these issues. So if we're interested in health promotion, if we're thinking about health as a community, it doesn't necessarily, as you're suggesting, have to be simply about queer folk, but thinking about how, what is the relationship between queer folk and people who aren't queer, or people who are hetero or, or however they identify within this community, and our, 
how are we creating health links or health relationships with one another? And it could be that we create events or we create opportunities for people to, to discuss, well, what does it mean to have a healthy community? To, to, to simply say like, what is a community? What is health? What are these things? And en engage people in those ideas of this is how I see the future of health. Or this is how I see the future of my community and try and bring those conversations together um, in a way that doesn't have to be queer, but certainly can, can encourage queer flows of thought, especially. Um, by bringing those those various people together. Did you say queer flows of thought? <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't know if Danielle or Jonathan or anyone else in the audience have any questions. I have a question, if you don't mind, and it's probably, I don't know how related it is, but just for general interest, I work within a clinical research facility and we have a patient and public involvement advisory service within that. And it is always a struggle to engage with and meet and try and establish a good report. Sorry, my horrible child is here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, how we um, establish a good relationship with um, those kind of patients or members of the public or even participants and get them to um, involve themselves or kind of put themselves out there and become involved with researchers to input into clinical research studies and that's going to benefit their long-term health. How do you think it would be a good way to engage or you know, put it out there? Or uh, yeah, it's just something that I've kind of been thinking about because all of these kind of groups do they are very split. They're your classic white, middle-aged, female-dominated kind of thing. So just to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, that's also another good question. So um, we can start uh, at the base of thinking about, well, what people need um, and what kind of tools can we serve those, those populations in order to, I guess the, the question is, is it necessarily to drive them towards clinical studies or is it something that can, can do we need to have support systems that enable them to, to interact with those as well as have someplace else? We see um, these, these kind of conversations in the work of um, uh, Alexandra Joac. Um, who wrote the, the book AIDS TV, where she's both talking about the histories of, of, of AIDS health promotion, but she's also working with these communities to say like, we can use cultural production to help to support people to, um, to create com care communities is probably not a word that she would use, it's a little bit early for her, um, but this idea that we can um, bring, we can have groups together where they can discuss these, these issues and that might enable them to then have the kind of um, language needed to interact with clinicians or interact with with professionals who are working in these spaces. Um, so it might, um, it wouldn't quite work the same as kind of a, a community links worker kind of thing, but it would be a, a space where we could encourage people to attend if they wanted to, to engage in cultural conversations about what yeah, type yeah. of they're experiencing. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it, it, it's partly that as well, but it's in providing that essence of co-production so that it's a shared resource and how valuable their experience is and not to you know devalue that in any way at all because it is so crucial so yeah that's yeah, really helpful absolutely. there's and there's some really interesting examples of this kind of collaborative work that um some of the people in my my research center the center for biominutes and self and society have been working with um patients and patient activists to develop like zines they've been working yeah. on like visual um, media mm -hmm. so forms of film and that kind of stuff where people are working together through their their experiences of health either in the clinic or out with the clinic um, and then bringing coming together to create this product and then showcasing it and saying hey here's our experience of of cancer or of, mm. of HIV and AIDS and this kind of stuff um, and saying and they can celebrate the fact that maybe they, they didn't have they didn't have the experience that they wanted but this is the experience that they were working through yeah yeah great okay thank you yeah we have time for one last question, and uh, this one is by Levi Mitchell. Levi, would you like to ask the question yourself, or are you happy for me to read it? I was just wanting to ask a bit um, about like funding and the sort of barrier it creates, or if you're finding it a sort of significant uh, sort of hindrance to community outreach and engagement and sort of researching these kinds of things. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Uh, it depends on what types of funding you're talking about and what kind of projects you're interested in. Um, so if you're interested in a slightly more institutional 
I'm sorry, I don't mean like you as, a, as an individual, but I'm just saying here generally, um, there, are, there are different types of funding streams that occur for this, this type of research. Um, the, the HIV innovation funding um, scheme in, through the, the, the Public Health England, um, recently renamed something, um, is the kind of like the big scale one that allows um, institutions across England to develop health campaigns and to, to innovate as, as they like, um, to create new messages about how to end HIV and AIDS. Um, as at a more cultural production level, of course, we have um, arts consuls, um, which of course make it much more difficult to, to interact with. But of course, the, the kind of hidden um, research, um, the, the kind of hidden um, funding that exists for this kind of stuff too is, is, is research um, institutions. So um, my center in particular is very, um, very engaged in this kind of um, public outreach. Of course, the, the limitation of this is that it's associated with the university and some people have perceptions of working with universities that makes it much more difficult. Um, but at the same time, some people also have the, the converse of saying like, oh, it's a research um, institute, so they want to work with that kind of thing. Um, so that's a kind of scattered way of saying there's this this funding comes from a lot of different bodies and usually you have to pull from a whole bunch of different things and it's not likely that you're always going to get it. Um, but there are possibilities depending on what types of, of messages you want to put out there. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chase, and, and thank you, everyone. We are just about to, to finish right on time, and we have some, um, we have some forms that we have put on the, on the chat, a link to fill in a, a feedback form to the, for this event, and hopefully you would be able to, to Fill, fill that form for us. And I just want to, to say thank you very much, Chase, for this enlightening talk. I really, really enjoy it. And I can see that from the questions that, that um, emerged from the audience, I can see that it was very engaging for, for everyone. It was just um, really, really good to, to see these um, to see this talk and to listen to this talk and thank you for your presentation and um, thank you Robbie, Danielle and Jonathan for your support in the organization of this event and of course thank you on, uh, to the audience for joining us and, and have before, a good evening everyone. Before, uh, before Edgar completely closes up uh, we have to thank Edgar uh, we have to thank Edgar for his superlative work at organizing multiple research seminars and uh, not only this event this evening but this is his last event uh, before he uh, leaves us um, and uh, so we're actually looking for a new research officer volunteer uh, so if anyone in the audience uh, is interested uh, you can ask Edgar while he's still here uh, <laughs> But uh, or just get in touch with myself or any of the committee, any of the team. Um, thanks, of course, to Chase. Uh, there is, I will share the feedback uh, with Chase uh, and the team. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, Chase's uh, presentation was so interesting, as was the Q&A. Great presentation and topic. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully uh, some more people will uh, add a few uh, words, also the demographics. Uh, it's really great to see that we've got some people uh, in from uh, across the UK, uh, London, Milton Keynes, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow uh, already. Uh, so that's wonderful. Um, thank you very much to uh, everyone who's attended from some names I recognize, uh, members, uh, Staff Pride Network, staff and students uh, and um, and uh, people from outside the university. Uh, and uh, just um, in response to a couple of feedback uh, points, uh, we will add some links to material and resources uh, in the whenever we upload the YouTube video. Uh, if you don't already subscribe to our YouTube, uh, please uh, go and have a look at that. The link is in the chat. Um, there are videos from all our events, uh, the previous research seminars that Edgar organized uh, and uh, all kinds of other fascinating topics. Um, and uh, we'll get those uh, links up uh, in the YouTube video for this. And the only other thing, next events. Some asked about next events. Um, I don't have any dates for you right now, 
uh, but we uh, will be having events in uh, June uh, around about Pride. Uh, and um, yeah, if you look out for those on our mailing list, uh, if you're not already, if you're uh, in the university and not already on, uh, let us know, uh, our Twitter and our Facebook um, and, um, and our Instagram. Yeah, it's, it's we've got all kinds. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, and um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Chase, would you like to have any uh, last words? Just thanks for everyone to, for attending. <laughs>